we've had Mary from Mobile Medical Diagnostics here and over on the on the right here and we actually have a really cool um, in, innovation that is very much in the space of shifting left and staying left. So it's a mobile x-ray machine, it's licensed uh, by uh, the EPA, it's transported in a vehicle uh, like this and instead of bringing a patient uh, towards the healthcare system, actually the x-ray machine goes towards the patient. Uh, this is another living lab, uh, that's an operation and uh, obviously, you know, uh, hospital grade um, x-rays are provided by this but some of the data is really uh, stunning from, from the pilots and the average range of patients where this was used for were 86 and in the past this patient at 86 would have required a hospital transfer with a nurse waiting around an A&E from anything from eight, 4 to 8 hours taking up a capacity and, and space and then have to be transported back uh, but the stunning data is that 85.1 percent of the patients that were treated actually avoided a transport uh, to a transfer to the hospital. So this is something that very much sort of takes uh, demand out of the acute system and treats people at home and it's extraordinarily reasonable. So please talk to Mary at the break and afterwards uh, on this technology. Now I'm going to ask Lorraine uh, Smith uh, to actually introduce, introduce the, the next demo. I'm delighted to have Martin Dunn, the National Director of the National Ambulance Service, with us to <coughs> witness uh, this demonstration demonstration and over to you. Um, Hi, uh, the next demonstration is uh, Blue Eye Technology. So basically, um, we are going to be having an accident here now any minute and you're going to see it. <laughs> what happens is um, the Blue Eye Technology is like a band that they wear on the head with a camera. And um, it also has um, sound. So uh, what happens is they then go to the scene of the accident and they're able to portray back what's happening at the accident speak to the physician in uh, the A&E the and get good advice on where they should be directing the patient. So this is going to be, there's a 999 call coming in now and you're going to see what happens. And Connor over here is um, going to be the physician looking at the accident and we have um, Martin Dunn very kindly uh, gave us Richard, Bronya and Hilary um, to help out. So they're the ambulance staff so you'll see now what's going to happen. Just go to the next slide. So what's going to happen now is a call is going to come in and um, into, into Medico in Cork. And Dr. Conadisi is on um, on duty in the emergency department. The paramedics are wearing the wearable video uh, blue eye, blue eye, and the call is coming in. And uh, Dr. DC is going to do a consultation now. Hello, this is Dr. Connor DC in the emergency department at Cork, handling the Medico Cork telemedicine support line. How can I help? Hi, Dr. DC. This is Richard Quinlan, pin number 5085, advanced paramedic, working with Grainne O'Shea, advanced paramedic also. Connor, just to give you an update, we are currently in a location in South Tipperary in Ardfinnan. Ardfinnan. We have a gentleman who has suffered what appears to be a head injury. The gentleman has fallen from a height of greater than eight feet. He had seizure activity on our arrival, currently has a GCS of three. I just want to look at a consideration of possibly going elsewhere other than the local hospital, which would be South Tip Prairie General Hospital. South Tip would be 30 minutes by the country roads and our weather conditions are quite severe. However, we are access to motorway and we're talking about a possible destination of Cork in approximately 40 minutes. If you just might want to have a quick look at his eyes for me. Okay, thanks Richard. I can see there that he's got uh bilateral bruising of his eyes, they're raccoon eyes, consistent with a base of skull fracture. Uh, has he any leakage from his ears, Richard? Yeah, if you just want to wait one second, I'll just give you a second uh, now, the first responder on the scene as well, who is assisting. Um, so we've yellowish tinge of fluid coming from his ear, kind of consistent with CF fluid, over. Okay, okay, so can we just recap then, Richard? He does look like he's got a base of skull fracture that would warrant neurosurgical um, uh, involvement. Um, can we just recap on his A, B, C, D, E, just his primary assessment, if you wouldn't mind, and make sure that we're we're not missing anything else. Okay, so A, we currently have a good airway. We've an oropharyngeal airway in situ. However, we have a GCS of three. He's on 100% oxygen, and his saturations currently on my monitor are 99% on that oxygen. He's slightly bradycardic at the minute. 
um, was tacky on our initial arrival. Breathing, we have bilateral and equal entry of breath sounds of the chest, checked by my partner and corroborated by myself. He doesn't seem to have a tender abdomen or a rigid abdomen, we've checked the quadrants. We're querying pelvis as well because of the height and we'll use a pelvic binder in relation to extrication. There is no external injuries or wounds that we can see of and there's no external hemorrhage. So at the moment, as far as we're concerned, it's head injury at the minute. There's no sign of any other injuries. However, we will immobilize C-spine fully and vacuum mattress. Great, Richard. Uh, that's a great job. I'll alert the trauma team that we can expect you in about 45 minutes. You make sure the CT scan is available and your surgeons are here as well on your arrival. If there's any deterioration in the meantime during transfer, let us know. And if there's anything else you need during transfer, let us know. Great okay, just, just very quickly, Connor, we've given 2.5 intranasal medals to stop a seizure. We're now going to give um, IV paracetamol to manage pain also, um, package with vacuum mattress, spinal immobilization, and both myself and Grania will travel and transport with assistance um, in the driving as well, over. Great, Richard. We'll see you in about 45 minutes. Okay, thank you very much for assistance. Just to confirm, we are going to CUH uh, just a greater than 10 minutes. Yeah. as opposed to going to Clamel. Yeah, so okay, that's, thank that's obviously very important, okay? So this patient needs to be in the right place, being seen by the right people. So he needs, your, he needs a trauma team, and he needs neurosurgeons, and he needs access to a CT scanner, and he's best to come directly to CUH by passing the smaller local hospital. Okay, and um, blood sugar as well, just for information, is 7.4. <laughs> he is hypertensive at the minute also. Let's get into Cork ASAP. Okay, so we've been on scene 10 minutes, approximately 5 minutes extraction time, and we'll be on the road then, and we'll contact through Tetra to say we're en route, and we'll give them an ETA. Great, Richard. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Connor. Thank you. just ask the ambulance team to come in and just actually have a very quick commentary in terms of how effective it was uh, from uh, the National Ambulance Service standpoint. Uh, please give them actually a round of applause. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just going to pop it out of my ear because we've a bit of an echo at the minute. Um, in, in relation to technology, I don't know what you could see, but for us on the side of the road, being able to communicate and seek a bit of oversight from the specialities is hugely beneficial and it assists us in making decisions slightly over what we would normally do. We do have a certain capacity to bypass, but you would have serious concerns for that gentleman and he's head injury. So Any questions? Would this Richard be, and thank you, it was a great time when came across, uh, if I'm ever in an accident, I want you. <laughs> but you, you, you need to talk to the boss. <laughs> but is, is this something, if this was deployed sort of nationally, would it be a you know, game changer for the National Ambulance Service? There's a number of technologies that we currently have implemented, thanks to Martin. Um, we beat PCR, we disengages with our LifePack 15, and for us, the next step is the wearable technologies, I suspect. Okay, so this is kind of a logical next step, and it is, you know, clear our National Ambulance Service is actually very technologically advanced, and this would be very complementary and would actually sit on top of the technologies that are yeah, already the most the last, for the last couple years. That's yeah, brilliant. Pleasure. So thanks so much. Thanks, Martin. Thank just at the minute, you probably can't hear, but as we speak at this moment in time, we've 11, we've a 10 car road traffic accident on going with 12 patients, right? And um, we've a fleet of eight to go to it, we've a medical director on the way to it as well. And the likes of that link that we could use into CUH could save a lot of hard time, a lot of road time. That's actually live as we're speaking. Okay. So the likes of that will always add benefits to patients and the patient value through the system. So it's kind of sending shivers down my spine thinking about that accident and it's all, yeah. it could be mutually applied. Yeah. Yeah. The, the other aspect is there's often an occasion where aeromedical support because of the weather wouldn't be able to assist and you have that road journey to deal with and you want to be reassured, number one, that they won't be expecting you and number two, that you've made the right decision. 
for that patient because that's our biggest concern. It's the patient first the surgery. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> So the next speaker actually is the best we could get for the money available. Actually, that's not true. Uh, so I think we were all proud when we saw this Time uh, magazine uh, sort of uh, issue with seeing a robot from Ireland and something that would you know, help to propel Ireland as a digital health lighter to a digital health leader. So I'm delighted to uh, welcome Dr. Conor McGinn, uh, who's the inventor of Stevie. And, um, Maybe, Connor, congratulations on the big success of Connor's just telling me he's kind of been flat out on the road since time happened. Everybody wants him and everybody wants Stevie. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about the uh, sort of the, the origin of Stevie and the third expression overnight success takes on average 10 years. I think that's the case uh, uh, for Stevie. So maybe Connor tell us a little bit you know, about where this project came from and what you're hoping to achieve. Sure, Th thank you. Um... Yeah, it's, it's been uh, a world over the last couple of months. I feel like I'm kind of more of the agent to Stevie rather than as uh, <laughs> part of the inventing team. I feel like most of the inquiries are dealing with nothing to do with me anymore. It's much more about can we bring Stevie such and such a place. Um, yeah, I suppose I, 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 as I, I kind of started to, 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 to work in robotics as an undergraduate student. Um, it, was, it was actually hard not to see just the unbelievable potential for kind of artificial intelligence combined with some sort of a physical form, which really what constitutes a robot. Um, to, to be able to make positive impact and um, I guess that sort of engineering journey was, was something that I was going through at the same time that I, my, my grandmother, who was a midwife, uh, she, she was doing myself and she started to lose her own independence and I had to, to really against her will uh, go to a nursing home and I saw what that did to her self-esteem uh, while the, the nursing home she went to, you know, we, we only had really good things to say about them, it was just um, a step down for her in terms of her quality of life and, and, and so on. So, so that sort of started a journey um, with, with me uh, around research, trying to understand what bottlenecks uh, existed, scientific or otherwise, um, that stopped this technology being built and was, was, was hyped for so long about robotics, we've been expecting it, but it hasn't arrived. And what me and my team have been trying to do is to, to, to try to find that critical path between you know, what we can prove out in the research and what we can prove in the lab to actually what transi transitions uh, and makes meaning impact and importantly, Improves the quality of life of, of, of older people and also the, the, the job conditions of, of the staff that are there. Um, and I guess that, that's, that's been the journey we've been on. Um, it's, been, it's been a hilly road, um, but, but I guess you know, we're reaching a point now where we, we, we think we have something that's, uh, that's ready to, to, to actually you know, leave the lab and go into the real world. That's an exciting place Great, there's a rumour that uh, Stevie was here, but I don't say where is he? <laughs> Stevie's behind me, so I think it's some of the world's uh, worst kept secret right now. Uh, Stevie's here. So we brought, we, we brought him along, he was uh, off the ferry, he was, in, he was in the UK, we were doing a pilot there for the last three weeks, so um, hopefully he's not too much. The, the, the ship didn't down too much, so... Uh, Hello everyone. Hopefully Connor has not been boring you all too much. <laughs> My name is Stevie. I am a social robot, and I want to help people stay independent as they get older. I am happy to be visiting the HSE. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> He's not camera shy. <laughs> so they probably you want to show us how Stevie might be using some use case with another person? Sure, so I, I want to do a couple of things. Um, I guess we, the thing we've probably been doing most will be particularly difficult to demonstrate here because what we found an opportunity for Stevie to do has been actually to help care staff and uh, facilitate group activities. Um, these are things that in retired communities deliver huge social and uh, wellness benefits for, for, for people. But it can be really hard for this, or we learn it can be really hard for, for care staff to do it because Quite often their uh, time and attention is split between you know, front of house stuff like, like, like this and actually working closely with, with residents. Um, so up until this point we've been able to build a number of applications that have gone down really well where Stevie is running kind of um, cognitively stimulating kind of quiz type activities which the level of adoption have, have really surprised us. Uh, similarly kind of music based therapies um, and even now looking more towards kind of even things like physical therapy which a robot that doesn't have legs, you might think it's very good, we're, we're, seeing, we're seeing otherwise. Um, what I think I can demonstrate is a couple of the, the, the key uh, applications that justify this as a platform technology. Um, the first is that in, in retiring community settings, 
uh, quite often people, uh, either through memory loss or, or, or other reasons, they need to know something. Uh, and it can be quite difficult and frustrating if there's no one around to be able to give them those answers. So I guess simple questions you, know, you, might, you might ask uh, you know, a robot like Stevie uh, in a retirement community would be simple things like, you know, hey Stevie, um, you know, do you know if, if there's anything coming up today that I, I, I need to know about? Do not forget, there is a bridge game on in the card room and your daughter Patricia is visiting tomorrow. Uh, so quite often, what, what seems to happen is that people they forget these things, and as a result, they end up missing phone calls. They end up uh, missing out on, on things that they'd otherwise uh, prefer to take part in. So that's a simple scenario. Um, another application that we've been exploring has actually been using um, Stevie as, a, as a, a way to mediate video calls. Uh, we were actually quite surprised talking to a lot of our, our kind of clients that. They were familiar with Skype and they'd used it, but for whatever reason it wasn't something they used regularly. And either through the fact that it was inaccessible or just not practical, um, it wasn't something that was really on the radar. Uh, and we felt that by, by designing the robot the way we have, where it's got screens in its face, that we could actually bypass uh, some of the accessibility issues. And it means we take responsibility away from these other adults who would otherwise need to maybe own the robot or, or own the, the app or how to use it, to just, you know, let's, let's, let's try and reduce any responsibility associated. So in this case, I'd say, you know, Stevie, maybe you could give uh, Andy in the lab a call. <laughs> so here, the, sure. the screen here just indicates that it's, 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 it's anything that's not on board the robot. We want to be quite transparent about this is going into the cloud. Uh, so that's what's happening. Um, the screens, you can see are kind of blank here. The robot at the moment is not connected to the internet. Um, if it was, you'd see the, the, the call going through on the, on the other side. And hopefully if uh, Andy is... answering the phone at the moment. I will leave a message to call back later. So, a simple app, you know, an app managing service can, can mediate that further. Um, again, another application that we've, we've started to explore has been, and probably our, as much as the older adult, uh, is, it's actually the, the care staff themselves who we see as our, our kind of primary users. Um, and one of the things we've, we've kind of noticed that on shifts, like so much happens, it can be really difficult to transfer important information between one shift and the other are starting. And what we found is that if, 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 if the staff adopt this technology and they're happy to share updates verbally to the robot, that robot can then take the responsibility to pass on information um, late, later, later on. So I suppose, um, we're going to have to suspend this belief a little bit here, but suppose I was a, a nurse starting my shift, I could say, you know, Stevie, I'm just starting my shift, you know, is there anything that I need to know about? There's a few things you should know before you start. Mrs. Kelly has not been feeling well. She had a bad night's sleep and I'm told she hasn't eaten breakfast. <laughs> so little things like this um, start to add value over time. And what we see, we when we view this as very much as a platform technology, it's something that we want to put this in the hands of the people who know how to use it best. Uh, and over the next couple of years we see the technology develop not just on the engineering side and the AI side of things, but also you know, trying to get this as something that you know, care staff can, can use as a, a tool to improve existing therapy programs uh, and kind of innovate in, in, on, on terms that suit them best. Great, thanks so much, okay. Connor. So Connor and Steve will be available at break and afterwards if you want to talk to us. So please give Connor a hand. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, we are at the Digital Academy Forum uh, here. This is a new mechanism for basically spreading ideas, sharing ideas, and actually solutionizing for the future. So hopefully, we'll, you know, we've, I think we've seen some ideas today already or solutions that we, we should look at deploying sort of nationally. Uh, our last pillar is digitization. Uh, one of the key areas that we want to work on is robotic process automation. Uh, we'll be running a workshop on January 30th in collaboration with Deeper. Uh, to focus on uh, two, two target areas for, for the HSC on guard vetting and on um, international um, uh, reforms for, for medical insurance. Um, so we, we'll be posting details um, um, about that and we'll have several speakers from the NHS talking about uh, how they are doing, uh, what they've done with robotic process automation. And the, the other part of digitization, and I want to check your glass, are we ready to go live on this? Uh, so we've uh, just launched, or about to launch in about 10 seconds, a new sort of digital transformation uh, website, which is the go-to place uh, for telling the digital transformation story. And here in the future, you'll actually be able to look at, we want to be very open here, the 35 or 40 technologies uh, that we're looking at for future deployment. What stage are they in? So are we live now, Ross? I know you're going out of maintenance mode into production mode. Exactly. 
30 seconds. So you can jump in, jump in. Digital health, <laughs> HSE, digital transformation, ed.ie is the website if, if you want to sort of check it out. We're on a five to 10 year journey. The first five years, the seven years will take us from being a digital laggard to a European leader. And if we're able to, um, you'll continue with the momentum. Potentially in 10 years, Ireland could be actually the go-to place and the global leader in digital health innovation. The OECD just published a report a couple of weeks ago, Health in the 21st Century, and they said the key, to bar key barriers to building the 21st digital health system are not technological. They are in the institutions, processes, and workflows towards long before the digital era. One of the key opportunities is actually to create new workflows uh, from outside in that actually completely disrupt uh, current workflows. So this is something that we'll be keeping in mind uh, all the while as, as we're working and we're busy. So that's a crystal top tour of our digital health strategy. Uh, we're running a little bit late. I'm now delighted to invite uh, Assistant Secretary General uh, Lucy fallon Warren from Deeper. This is in the middle of the uh, Our Public Service Innovation 2020.